Thank you, Alice, for inviting me, and Anna, it's a, a pleasure to be here today um, and to uh, chair this panel. So I'm um, really looking forward to the discussion. So I was asked to tell you a little bit about why bioethics uh, should be important, why you should care about bioethics. So I thought I would just tell you a little bit, brief, very briefly, about how I got into bioethics and what I see opportunities in bioethics for you guys. So, I was originally trained in biotechnology in Italy and in the US. I was working in a gene therapy, vascular endothelial growth factor gene therapy in, as an international center for genetic engineering and biotechnology based in Trieste, some of you might know it. But while I was working on that kind of gene therapy with v, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, I uh, started discussing what are possible applications of the technologies that go beyond therapy that could be used to enhance human performance uh, in, uh, for example, um, ath athletic performance. And indeed, the laboratory where I was working on, directed by Mauro Giacca, had funding by the World Anti-Doping Agency to develop uh, mouse and rat models uh, of uh, gene-enhanced uh, with um, um, mice uh, in order to come up with detection technology in preparation for the, uh, that was uh, the, Beijing Olympics and the London Olympics. So gene therapy uh, is included in the World Anti-Doping Agency, one of the technology um, in the prohibited list as doping since um, 2002. So it's been it's quite a while. Maybe we haven't heard talking about that only more recently, but that's something that uh, uh, has been included for a while. And there are laboratories that work on gene therapies that also have funding to develop models. So I got interested in what are the possible announcement application of gene therapy and uh, when I saw the opportunity of, um, I did my first PhD in biotechnology but in moving away from the bench um, and I discussing the social and ethical implication, I got some training in philosophy of medicine uh, at King's College London. So I moved away from the bench and now I work uh, in bioethics always in uh, uh, how genetics uh, uh, shape some new ways of life in reproduction, but also in, uh, in sport. Um, and I have the great like, fortune of being able to teach to a variety of students that come from all over the world, Kings, to study for one year master. And they're really students from any kind of background. Uh, we have a lot of students who study biology, biotechnology, engineering, medicine, other anthropology, philosophy, social sciences, uh, law, whatever. And they're going on to continue into careers uh, uh, in policy making, many of them, and we need a lot of them also in relation to topics that were mentioned by Sir John Walker, uh, topics that you may think uh, are not necessarily uh, are broader um, related to the life sciences, such as energy, such as climate change. Those are topics uh, that fall under the broad umbrella of bioethics, which should really be understood as something broader than just medical ethics, but everything that relates to the life sciences, so including the environment. And um, um, indeed, um, uh, I don't know if uh, it may be um, uh, something uh, for you to um, just a good anecdote to know is that the definition of uh, bioethics, as we know, is the Anglo Saxon word, uh, was a term that was coined by an oncologist in the US in 1971, uh, von Resselau Potter, who wrote this little book called Bioethics A Bridge to the Future. And bioethics was defined as the science of human survival. So, quite ambitious, as you may think, but really, how can we ensure the survival of the human species in an ethical way? And the, the question, it was a kind of visionary, the questions that he had for our future were uh, how to deal, um, to ensure that we have a planet, which is, shouldn't be taken that for granted, uh, how to deal with pollution and uh, climate change and a depletion of natural resources, how, how to preserve nature, and how to deal with population and increase in population and uh, how to control fertility in a way that is ethical, plus all the questions related to the impact of technology in society, which is maybe what we usually associate with biotechnology, but wanted to make the point that really is broader. So in terms of careers 
for those of you who may say, okay, maybe at some point in my life I want to move away from the bench, which is what I, I did. Uh, so policy um, and consultation, consultancy, also clinical ethic consultation, everything related to clinical trials. Uh, and when we hear a bit more about you know, preparedness from pandemics during the panel, uh, now with the genome editing and the mitochondrial DNA replacement technology, everything that relates to reproduction, we definitely we need uh, bioethicists and policy makers there, and also all genome uh, sequences and uh, open access data, digital health, we'll hear about that too. Uh, another career, uh, which may be open is in public engagement and public communication of science. So it, it relates also to the uh, topic of the second panel today. But definitely there are many ways in which you could be uh, involved in bioethics even if you don't necessarily want to pursue a career. But if you are based in the UK uh, yeah, or there, are, there is something called the Institute of Medical Ethics that organizes uh, conferences and panels. There are ways for you to be involved. If you're, and this year, in, uh, in June, we have the International Association for Bioethics, which is a big international association that comes every three years to this part of the world. It's going to be in Edinburgh together with the IME. If you are coming from somewhere else in the world, there are the every country, the American Association for Bioethics in Japan, uh, you also have uh, the equivalent in Japan. So there are many ways for you to, if you have an interest, to be involved. And I think uh, it's really uh, something that you should understand as um, uh, it's, it's broader than uh, just uh, uh, the medical ethics or doctor-patient relationships. Everything relates to life sciences and to bio, so to life. So this said, I'm delighted to introduce the first uh, uh, panelist for today, uh, Professor Tim Child, Medical Director of the Oxford Fertility Unit and funding um, and founder of Fertility Partner UK, which is the UK largest fertility network. And I'm delighted also to introduce Professor Tim Lewins, a professor of philosophy of science here at the University of uh, Cambridge and um, director of the Center for Arts, uh, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities at Cambridge. And also uh, Tim was a former member of the Nuffield Council of Bioethics, which I should have mentioned is the UK deliberative body working on bioethics and producing reports that can then be used in policy making such as. So the first two speakers are going to give their perspectives on genome editing, mitochondria, DNA replacement technologies, and we're and first we're going to give the perspective, and then we can take uh, uh, questions for you. So, with Tim, uh, Tim, and Tim. Thank you very much. <coughs> There's two Tims, one from Ox, one from uh, well, Cambridge, one from Oxford, but uh, we're not all called Tim in the UK. So, in fact, I was a medical student here in here in Cambridge a long, long time ago, and I, I then went to the other place where I've been for over 20 years now. So it's very nice to come back uh, today for the meeting, have a wander around last night. So I'm not, I, I'm not a bioethicist, I don't, you know, I'm not a professional bioethicist, I'm also not a bench, clinic, uh, bench scientist either, I'm a, I'm a clinician, an academic clinician running uh, one of the largest IVF units in the UK, which is a part of the University of, of Oxford. And um, as such, I see patients on a daily basis who either are affected by the disease of infertility or who have a... a often have had a child affected by a genetic disorder. So, them, so for couples who've had a child with a genetic disorder, they don't themselves have infertility, but obviously they have a problem affecting reproduction. And so couples are referred in on a, on a, on a daily, weekly basis to us, very often bringing in a child with a severe genetic disorder or who have lost a child either during pregnancy or perhaps in the early um, few years of life. And so myself and my, my, my colleagues in our unit see on a daily basis the distress and the sadness in these couples. So for me, I work in a very ethically challenging area, but I'm not a bioethicist as, as such. Now, for couples who are referred in, who have had a child or they have a, a, you know, a, a genetic disease running through their, their family, then they're referred to us to discuss what are the options for them. So one of the things I was asked to talk about today was what are the options? Obviously, we'll finish up with gene editing, but in reality today, 2016, what are the options? Well, the option worldwide for these couples who either have had a child who's died with a genetic disorder or is affected, the main option, obviously, is just to keep on trying. Russian roulette. If there's a recessive disorder running through that family, there's going to be roughly a one in four chance that, they are, that their next child is affected by whatever disorder is running through their family. They can then either decide just to have an affected child 
or they could consider prenatal diagnosis and potentially um, uh, termination of pregnancy. And that obviously is not acceptable for all couples. Another option would be just, just to accept childlessness, just to stop trying altogether. Again, not an entirely acceptable option for most people. The third option would be to use gamete donation, egg, sperm, or embryo donation. Again, quite widely used. A problem is there's a shortage of egg, sperm, and embryo donors in the UK and worldwide. It's also very, very expensive. And importantly, there is, no, there, there is then no genetic link between the person whose gametes are being replaced and the child. The fourth uh, widely used option would be pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So we do a lot of this. This would involve the couple going through an IVF cycle, making embryos, and then us biopsying the embryos at the day three or day five, it's the blastocyst stage, analyzing those cells to see which, if any, of the cells are affected by whichever disorder we're looking for. A problem with that is the couple have to go through IVF. It's expensive, about 10,000 10, pounds, about $15,000 per cycle. In the US, it'd be much more expensive than that. And there is a possibility that there would be no embryos available. It might be the couple only make two or three embryos anyway, maybe through chance. All of them are affected. They have nothing to go back. They've got to start all over again. So therefore, that then leads us on to what other options in terms of the future. So for couples where there's mitochondrial disease running through um, the family down the maternal line, there is now the possibility of mitochondrial transfer, which, as you'll be aware, has recently been permitted by the HFEA in, in, the, in the UK, although it's not actually clinically been done yet. But that's something, uh, in Oxford, we have a we're one of the, the UK's mitochondrial disease centres, so we see a lot of couples with mitochondrial disease, and our couples are very, very keen to get going with this. I'm very keen to crack on with this as someone working in this field. I think the more contentious part, though, is the gene editing using techniques such as CRISPR, where, in fact, you can actually knock out, take out, the, the, uh, the faulty genes, such as the cystic fibrosis mutation. The issue with that, though, at the moment is, whilst it has sort of been permitted in the UK, it's really more on a, on a research setting. So at the moment, it's, it's more understanding uh, via our colleagues at the Crick Institute. They're trying to understand what genes are important for early embryo development. If we can understand what genes are important for early embryo development, that can then lead on to, for instance, understanding why some couples have recurrent miscarriage, why some couples have infertility, and perhaps using drug targets to then treat those couples. If instead we're using gene editing to actually take out genes such as cystic fibrosis or the genes causing muscular dystrophy, etc., that then has much wider ethical implications in that then what are the effects on other parts of the genome um, are there unintended effects, perhaps through off-target cuts, which may then have very long-term consequences? And at the moment, we can actually use other options, such as PGD or egg donation. So for me personally, ethically, I think gene editing to actually knock out or take out faulty genes is a step too far. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, so we'll hear from the other team from Cambridge. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so Tim's are on a buy one, get one free deal at the moment. Um, so I've been asked to talk uh, for about five minutes um, about both uh, mitochondrial transfer technologies and CRISPR, so we'll see if we can um, rattle through this. Um, and I'm going to try and use the mitochondrial case partly to shed light on the CRISPR case as well. So in the mitochondrial case, I mean, roughly speaking, there have been kind of three broad areas of ethical concern raised, and I'm not sure we should really be too worried about any of them, actually. Um, one of them, very much in the press at the time, a year or so back, was the notion that here we would have so-called three-parent babies. Three-parent babies because there'd be a genetic contribution from the woman whose nucleus uh, goes into the production of the child, also from the donor of the enucleated egg or embryo with healthy mitochondria, and of course, uh, contribution from uh, of, of the sperm as well. Um, legally in the UK, there won't be three parents, there will only be two, there certainly won't be two mothers. The only mother is the person who actually takes the child's term, gives birth to the child. Of course, it might nonetheless turn out that the child born to these technologies may conceivably regard three people as parents. That, that may be their choice, that may be how they regard it. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, it's not clear to me that there is anything wrong with that. I think, as a matter of fact, it's quite unlikely that most children born to these technologies will regard the donor of the enucleated egg with healthy mitochondria as a, a parent in, in a full-blooded sense of the term. But even if they did, I don't see why we should be too worried about that. 
After all, there are many cases already where children grow up regarding far more than two people as having very important contributions in their genesis, in their ongoing formation. They may regard grandparents as having an important role, step-parents as having an important role. We're used to negotiating the idea that more than two people play an important role in our lives and in our early formation. So I just don't think we should be too worried about that. What we should be worried about is whether the welfare of these children will be damaged. And there, all psychological evidence suggests that the most important thing for a, a, a happy uh, child is simply that they're born into a, into a loving, reasonably stable family environment. And there's no reason to think that that wouldn't be the case here. Another worry that was aired um, about mitochondrial transfer techniques was that it would be a form of germline uh, intervention. Uh, and I think it would be. Uh, the whole point of these techniques is that they will stop people from having uh, children affected with these diseases and that the children themselves will then not pass those diseases on to their own children. Um, is this a problem? Again, it's not clear to me that this is a problem. By the way, some parliamentarians tried rather heroically to deny at the time that these were properly germline interventions, but it seems to me that it's a pretty, a pretty clear case. Um, one reason why this then becomes important is that the CRISPR technologies now arise in an environment where there is already a very marked precedent for thinking that some forms of germline intervention may be perfectly permissible. So it's rather hard now in the CRISPR debate to say, well, the one thing we're sure of is that germline interventions can't be ethically sound. The mitochondrial case is effectively a strong counterexample to that. It's a strong precedent against that. Um, but we also need to ask the question, why are we so worried about germline interventions in the first place anyway? The kind of reasons that are often trotted out, for example, this was views put forward by the NIH uh, last year in the context of CRISPR. Uh, the problem with germline interventions is that they affect multiple generations. Um, they are, uh, their effects are, are not necessarily uh, in, entirely, uh, entirely certain, and they're also hard to undo. Um, now, there are many, many interventions that are like this that we tolerate all the time. So uh, large-scale urban planning, for example, affects more than one generation. It's very hard to undo once the infrastructure is there, and its effects on future generations are not completely certain. But people don't typically call for moratoria on large-scale urban planning. So one thing that this all forces us to do is to be much clearer on exactly what we think the problem is supposed to be with germline intervention in the first place. Um, of course, there are quite serious issues potentially about risk and about whether or not any one of these techniques is, is suitably safe and suitably efficacious. Um, in the UK, we had a very, very thorough debate on that. Uh, one thing that I just want to raise here is an interesting way in which labor was divided during that discussion. So effectively, groups like the Nuffield Council on Bioethics were charged with looking at the ethics of things like the mitochondrial case. Um, meanwhile, groups like the HFEA were charged with looking at safety and efficacy. And the HFEA's report, reports rather, I should say, tended to say things like, this report is solely concerned with scientific issues and won't take a stand on any ethical issues. Now, I'm actually rather skeptical about whether or not it's possible and even desirable to draw a really strong distinction there between the scientific phase and the ethical phase. My reason for skepticism is that the question of whether a technology is adequately safe is never, it always depends on exactly how much evidence we have and exactly where we think the evidential threshold should be. And the question of where the evidential threshold should be itself is informed by the question of how valuable we think these technologies are in the first place. The more important we think they are, the greater the need they are, the more likely we are to think that we should press ahead urgently. If we think that the need is rather minor, then we're likely to think that we need lots and lots of evidence before going ahead with a potentially shaky technology. In that sense, it seems to me that ethical evaluation and evaluation of safety should actually go hand in hand, perhaps rather more than was the case in the very strict way that labor was divided in the mitochondrial case. Okay, that's all I'll say. Uh, thank you very much to both panelists. Uh, lots of interesting points. Before we open up for questions, I wanted to add something about the HFA. I'm just not sure whether uh, everybody in, in the audience um, knows since it was mentioned by both of you. So the Human Fertilization and Biology Authority regulates assisted reproduction and research on human embryos in the UK. So any uh, clinics that um, well, 
for example, in the case of, of um, uh, Tim Charles, uh, the director of Tax for Fertility Clinic, a clinic needs to have a license granted by the HFEA to perform IVF, to perform pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. There is a list of conditions for which people in the UK can access uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which was mentioned as one of the alternatives to uh, genome editing, uh, possibly. Uh, in the case also of the Francis Crick group, uh, which was mentioned, so the, the first group was now a license by the HFPA to uh, research and apply CRISPR genome editing technology to the human embryo, but only in a research setting. This is also because the HFPA regulates uh, embryo research in the UK. There is a law 1990, Human Embryology Act, that says that research can be done on the human embryo only up to 14 days in vitro. But this is not like a blanket uh, permission. Each research group needs to apply for a license. So um, uh, this is um, relevant also for the discussion of how is the, the division of labor, which is an interesting, very interesting point about, um, you know, can we really separate that clearly ethics from science and assessment of uh, uh, risk or threshold of uh, evidence? So questions from you for uh, the first two speakers? Yes, please. Hello, I'm a PhD student at the University of Dusseldorf in Germany. I'm interested, uh, given that this is a global summit, if there is such a thing as global ethics. And if there is none, uh, then would that become like a competitive advantage in places where there is no regulation or ethics is regarded differently as in places in China or India? Thank you. Um. <laughs> Is there such a thing as global ethics? Um, I mean, of course, there are various kind of ethical codes which have very, very large numbers of signatories all over the world. There are also codes which not everybody is signed up to, but which nonetheless carry a certain amount of weight. Um, there are absolutely kind of, kind of rogue jurisdictions where standards are lower than they are in this country or in other parts of Europe or in the States. So yes, there's absolutely variation. Um, and it's, it's always a difficult question, I think, as to uh, how you're then supposed to uh, regulate your own internal uh, ethical landscape when you know that potentially people can travel to other countries to seek various services under regimes that might be far less scrupulous. Um, so, I mean, absolutely, the, the, the lack of standards is in some ways a problem. At the same time, I don't think one should insist that there's perfect standardization everywhere across the world. And my reason for saying that is that uh, ethics is an area where there is absolutely scope for perfectly reasonable disagreement. And because there's scope for perfectly reasonable disagreement, I think it's then also perfectly understandable that different regimes would have different views about, for example, research on embryos, where you know, work in the, the, the environment in Germany is quite different to the environment here in the UK, is quite different to the environment in France. Um, and and that, that, reflects, that reflects reasonable disagreement that responsible deliberative, deliberative bodies have, have come up with. Right. So there was another question in the row, and then in the back. Hi, my name is Sebastian, a PhD student from the University of Cambridge. I was wondering, in your opinion, are there any ethically significant differences between interventions targeted at the genetic level and interventions targeted at other levels? Um, in terms of other levels, what, what, what do you mean by well, other levels? Morally acceptable or un currently uncontroversial interventions. I mean, even, well, controversy is an interesting one. So, for instance, PGD is allowed in the UK, but there's, other, there's many countries in the world where PGD is, is not allowed. So this kind of comes back to, I think, to the ethical setting with which you work, which you work in. Um, I, I suppose also it depends on, on, on who you're asking. So, for instance, for, for some couples, termination of pregnancy would be considered completely, completely unacceptable, um, whereas it may well be that, um, you know, germline intervention, so they're not actually terminating life as they would see it, would be entirely acceptable. So from my point of view, I think that, um, yes, there are differences, but it depends on your personal viewpoint. I mean, I've, I've always tended to be very skeptical of the idea that there's a kind of really kind of bright line between, on the one hand, genetic interventions which are unacceptable and various other forms of interventions which are perfectly fine. And there are various ways of trying to kind of get at that point. Um, 
Recent research in epigenetics is somewhat contentious as to exactly how it should be interpreted. The question of whether or not uh, epigenetic modifications really do kind of stick down multiple generations is something that different scientists disagree on. But if it turns out that there are kind of reasonably, reliably inheritable epigenetic modifications, then that's absolutely a way of raising the question, well, why is it that we're so specifically worried about interventions to the genome when there are potentially many, many ways of introducing reasonably reliable inherited variation, perhaps variation that will result in enhancements above what's normally needed for health? I realize that's contentious because people working in the epigenetics area disagree about exactly what these effects are like. But then you can push a little bit further out because the very question of exactly what counts as an epigenetic intervention is also something that scientists disagree on. So some people have rather narrow understandings of epigenetic interventions as relating rather specifically to kind of chromatin structures marking on nuclear genes. Other people have very, very expansive understandings. It's just anything that's not genetic that makes a difference to what's inherited. And then things like diet becomes part of epigenetics. So do various kinds of cultural inheritance. And then again, you come back to the thought, well, why are we specifically worried about ge genetic intervention when there are many, many ways of potentially interve intervening in a clumsy way in the lives of future children, which is partly why I'm somewhat slyly alluding to the notion of town planning earlier on. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't really good reasons to be worried about specific genetic interventions. It might just be the wrong technology to use, as, as, as Tim has effectively suggested in the case of CRISPR. It just might, we might not be ready yet. There might be other easier ways of getting to the same outcome. Um, if you want your kids to be healthy and happy, uh, Right now, probably the best thing to do is to make sure that they have lots of books to read, that they do lots of exercise and so on and so forth, not to start mucking about with their nuclear genes unless they're potentially affected by a very serious disease. So, of course, there are reasons to be skeptical in specific instances, but it's very hard to come up with a kind of blanket, genes bad, other things fine kind of verdict. Great. So we have time for two more questions, probably, uh, in the back, or maybe? Hello. Um, I've got a question about um, how much the UK should take into account other countries' cultures when taking uh, bioethical decisions. I'm asking this because you made it sound like um, there can be disagreement in bioethics and one country can do one law and another country can do another law. But once the UK uh, opens the door to three-pound babies and... Um, genetic engineering of embryos, um, couples from abroad might come in to, to have their baby in the UK. So that will put pressure on, the, on their home country to also open that technology because that's lots of revenue on that market. Um, for example, in Switzerland, a third of the assisted suicides are committed by um, death tourists. And so, um, I wonder how much a country should take into account other countries' cultures when taking decisions, or otherwise there's kind of a loss of control and there's a domino effect and once the UK opens the door, everyone else has to do it because of, because sure. of loss of revenue. Or and I think there's, been, there's obviously been health and reproductive tourism for years and years and years at the moment. Um, most UK patients, for instance, who need egg donation actually are going abroad for egg donation, particularly to, to Spain and Eastern Europe, because of the different laws and cultures in, in other countries. Um, I, personally, I feel that the way that the UK has, has handled and dealt with the, the, the recent discussions on mitochondria and also gene editing is, is, a, is a world model, because I think there's been a very wide-ranging public discussion. This isn't being decided just by a few committees of sort of uh, grey-haired men. It's, um, it's being decided, it, it is at the end of a public consultation, it has been done in a very regulated way, and so I think um, other countries should look at the UK. They may not agree with, how, with what the UK's decision has been on this, but I think they should look at the, 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 the way the public have been involved in the discussion as, as being a model. Now, there may well be some patients who do come to the UK to access this in the same way as there have been patients going from the UK to Belgium, for instance, who are the first to do some other techniques on, 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 on sperm uh, uh, issues during uh, uh, fertility problems. I think the reality is there's not going to be floods of patients coming into the UK for this. It's not going to put strains on the UK. I don't think the UK opening up 
is going to put um, other countries' um, regulation systems under any pressure at all. And I th- as I, because I, as I said, I think this is actually the model for the way forward. So I mean, the, in 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 the in the mitochondrial case. Um, a, a report, a big report that came out in the US quite recently made a slightly different recommendation to, to the way that things have gone in the UK. In, in the US, they suggested that maybe it would be a good idea to use sex selection uh, to ensure that, uh, only, that initially uh, only um, male babies would be born to these mitochondrial techniques in a way to ensure that basically germline issues were cut off, right? Because that way you wouldn't have any, you wouldn't have any little girls who would then grow up to potentially pass on problems associated with the technique itself to their own children. Um, that's a decision that they've, that they met, it's not finalized yet, but that, that may be the way things go in the US. The UK deliberated about that and decided it was the wrong thing to do. Seems to me that that's a kind of fairly fine judgment call, actually, as to exactly how you go on that issue. We went one way, the US may well end up going another way, but I don't think that difference is going to lead to a kind of terrifying sort of, you know, moral arbitrage that rely, that, that leads to the UK having thousands and thousands of people who both have these mitochondrial diseases and specifically want girl children right in the first generation kind of not banging, banging on the door. Um, there may be other cases where it is a little bit more like that, but, but not in this one. So there, in some cases, at least, I think this disagreement across jurisdictions is, is not problematic. L- last quick question. Um, then we may have time at the end, but let's take one. I don't know. Uh, hi, my name's Ian. Um, so it seems like the kind of area where you could uh, potentially have a lot of public backlash that could you know, stunt future progress towards uh, greater technological uh, solutions for, for healthy living. So what do you see as our liabilities? Um, what sort of event or growing you know, level of misinformation could uh, catalyze such a backlash? Um, and how do we you know, help counteract that? I, th- I think uh, I mean, the issue with the gene editing will be a, a, a problem is that until you actually take the step of um, using it in a clinical setting and actually seeing, you can do all the research you like, but in the end it's going to be, you know, the proof of the pudding will be actually the health of any children born from, from gene editing. I think the backlash would come if there were very clearly any unexpected problems with the babies, with the first few babies being born. Um, although it might, not be 10, it might be 10, 15, 20 years before there are any issues found out. Going back, for instance, to, to ICSI, which is a technique where the sperm is injected into eggs, which, came, which was developed in Belgium in the early 1990s, um, there really wasn't a lot of discussion or debate around that at all, and we now know that there are some epigenetic and other issues with using ICSI. There's not been a major backlash uh, about that, though, partly b- because the people who are benefiting from having ICSI ha- you know, have children, and they are aware now of any of these small extra risks that might be there, they are counselled fully and they decide to actually whether to go ahead or not. Mm. I mean, just very quick, I mean, one of the interesting things about the mitochondrial case is how overwhelmingly positive the people suffering from these diseases have been uh, with respect to the introduction of these technologies. And in some ways that's quite unusual because sometimes uh, in the case of genetic technologies that promise to er eradicate diseases, people who suffer from those diseases will say, well, these te- the use of these technologies will mean that people like me wouldn't exist. In the mitochondrial case, there was comp- very, very strong support. And, and I think that by itself, purely on a pragmatic level, was very important for the people who were really keen to get these technologies made legal, to, 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 to make their argument work. Because it's very, very difficult as an ethicist to argue against something when a, pa- when a bunch of patients are standing up in front of you saying, this has made my life go very badly, it's caused me huge amounts of trouble, and I would really very much like this technology to be licensed. Um, so purely, purely pragmatically, that, that, that is one of the reasons why it's been comparatively smooth, actually, I think, the, the, the move towards legalization here. Great, so I think we're going to move to the second uh, uh, panel and the discussion now, second speaker. But if you still have questions, there might be time at the end, or I'm sure there also, uh, it's a related topic first. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Federica Lucivero. Uh, Federica is a Marie Curie Fellow at King's College London. Um, she's a, a PI on a research grant called Health on the Move, working on digital health uh, 
uh, mobile health and the ethical and social issues related to digital and mobile health. But today we are asked uh, Federica to uh, give us her perspective on how we should regulate the privacy of genetic data in all genome sequencing um, uh, projects, how to balance privacy concern with the potential benefits arising from all genome sequencing uh, research. So Professor John Harris, unfortunately, is not here because uh, um, he sends his apologies, but is uh, unwell. Uh, so I have the floor is to Federica and uh, also covering for John. <laughs> Thank you, Silvia. Um, well, scientists have always been collecting data and uh, storing them, uh, analyzing, interpreting them. Uh, this is kind of an intrinsic aspect, you know, uh, data analysis, data storage and collection is an, an intrinsic aspect of the scientific endeavor. And at the same time, it seems like that governing um, repositories of um, human tissues uh, and samples, like the so-called biobanks, is nowadays a, uh, an issue that keeps policymakers, regulators, um, industries, biotech industries, um, academics, and bioethicists, of course, very much, um, I wouldn't say awake at night, but it is, it is a very hot topic. Um, so from uh, 1990s, uh, the beginning of, of the Human uh, Genome Project till the, the end of it in 2001, uh, up, up to you know, the first uh, sequencing of um, the whole human genomes in, in, in 2007 with, uh, with uh, the genome of Watson and uh, Venter being, uh, being published non-anonymously. Uh, there have been like a lot of, there has been a lot of, uh, the, well, the, 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 you know, many things have been evolving uh, in terms of um, uh, data, um, well, in terms of research using biobanks. And uh, so basically what happened is that the cost of sequencing have been drastically falling, uh, that uh, the uh, collection, data collection has become um, like, ha has become large scale, and that uh, the time of sequencing whole genomes has been really uh, getting much less than how it was at the beginning. And um, uh, basically, it is, um, and, and that basically uh, the automatization of and collection of analysis for the purpose of research um, uh, has been increasing. What we also see is that uh, there are many international consortia uh, working on uh, sharing databases and needing to share databases for large uh, research projects. Um, another evolution that we saw is how uh, different type of databases can be linked right now and also databases collecting health data from different type of sources uh, being um, uh, mobile apps uh, as well as uh, wearable sensors as well as uh, electronic health records. So uh, things have been changing a lot in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, 30 years. Um, and several issues are, of course, uh, that's why I was saying it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of interest for uh, regulators and, and bioethicists, and more and more also for, uh, you know, it, it will be for you guys, and uh, it is definitely for industry. Um, why? Because there are, of course, some trade-offs between uh, the protection of participants who are involved in research um, and whose data is stored in these repository, uh, repositories and the, pro the, the protection of, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the benefits of, of research 
that can come from uh, uh, linking these databases and uh, collecting all this data and, and analyzing it. Um, so in terms, so I'll, I'll, I'll just like to, to bring up some questions um, and, uh, and then leave it, re leave it up to the discussion. So on the, on the one hand, in terms of protection of participants, uh, we have the issue of, um, of communica communicating results to participants. Um, so the question of, you know, what, what, I, what type of uh, clinical meaning uh, the, the scientific discovery has uh, for participants is, of course, uh, is of course very relevant. Uh, but then comes the point of what if, uh, you know, the type of, um, for example, about um, uh, unexpected fundings, um, and uh, what, what should we, should we go back to participants and saying, okay, listen, on, in light of new research, we have realized that you may have a, um, a predisposition to this or that disease. Um, another aspect is the protection of relatives, um, in the sense that uh, my genome is not only mine, uh, and of course, what can be discovered through my genome from the sequences of my genome is uh, something that may be uh, important for my relatives. And so what are the rights of uh, family relatives to, to know uh, or uh, to, to be, whose privacy to be protected um, from, um, uh, whose privacy to be protected. Um, another aspect is the protection for use. Um, in the sense that uh, in, in the case of databases, um, the, let's say, principles, usual traditional principle of proper informed consent that we use in clinical, for example, interventions um, are very, uh, well, do, do not apply or are, it's, it's really hard to make them apply uh, in the sense that um, how can I, uh, well, w once I, uh, I, 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 I take, you know, I, I agree for my data, to my data to be used in a specific type of research, then uh, that data cannot be used for, uh, in, a, in another context by other parties. Um, and as this will protect my own privacy and my own decision, however, this will, uh, probably endanger a lot of useful research that could be done. And again, think again about the case of uh, large international consortia uh, and uh, how um, regulation in one country where, for example, data is collected can be different from regulation in other country when this data, uh, these data also have to be uh, used and analyzed and processed. And then we go back to the question of, you know, somebody raised about the global ethics um, in the sense that uh, it's, not, it's not only a matter of where a specific project is done, um, but it's, uh, it, it's it, you know, it's an issue that involves uh, different, uh, you know, different countries and which will probably have also different ethical framework. Um, so, of course, people have been thinking about different ways of thinking about consent in this case, in these cases, also on the basis of the fact, also of empirical evidence, that not, you know, that many participants in research are willing to share um, and are willing to, 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 to have their data be used in useful research. So yes, privacy is important. Yes, data protection is important. Yes, we want to make sure that this data, that the, 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 you know, the privacy and the identity of the person is protected. But also uh, the uh, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, talks about the right to share scientific advancement and the duty besides the duty to protect data donors. So the question is the question of how do we do like responsible sharing of 
um, how do we use also technologies to, pro, you know, to, to, to responsibly share this data. Um, and I think I will leave it here because I'm a little bit out of time. Thanks. Thank you, Federica. I actually think we do have some more time since John Harris um, is not here. So if you want to finish what you were saying, go ahead. Please. Uh, well, yes. Uh, so I, if I can say, I, I can say that. Um, I would say two, two issues. One is one uh, few, pro, few, few solutions that have been. Um, uh, so I was saying how, to, how we use technology and uh, governance, you know, uh, technological safeguards and governance safeguards in order to make sure that sharing of data is responsible. And some people have also been um, proposing to put patients uh, and sorry and participants in research, which are not necessarily patients. Um, uh, at the center of, uh, of, of the governance process. So, for example, people have been talking about different models of consent, like dynamic consent, um, where patients can decide, uh, are informed who, about who will, use the research, who will use the data that they have provided, in which context, for what type of research, and then can make decisions on, um, you know, what research authorized and were research not non-authorized. And this raises some few practical problems because can you imagine receiving emails all the time that your, um, your data is used? But still, uh, it's a way for sure to, to, to look at it at a more participatory way uh, to, 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 to address this, this issue of governance. Um, and the, the very last thing I, I wanted to say is about how this becomes, of course, much more complicated when we go beyond, you know, the academic, uh, public, uh, research context, and we include uh, big, um, you know, commercial companies and and stakeholders and industrial stakeholders. Um, so third parties that uh, sometimes also have access to these databases, and then he raises question about who will who should finance them, and uh, uh, should we use public money uh, to create these databases and make them available, open sources, available to private companies, and what are the responsibilities, for example, in sharing the, resources, uh, the, the research. Um, and I think with this, I'm, I'll be done, yes. Great, thank you, Federica. I mean, these are really like uh, important <coughs> question because we are, um, you can see that some traditional pillars of research ethics, such as informed consent, are being reshaped and the participant uh, in um, the patients become um, a participant in the research. Uh, and so we are, uh, this brings to a rediscussion of some like uh, very important concept in, um, in bioethics. And uh, so any question from you uh, related to what Federica said about also Digital health, mobile health, yeah. Hi there. Um, given the problem of selection bias, where there are systematic, unpredictable differences between people that consent and that do not consent, or where people might not even be available or return consent forms, uh, do you think that consent is even necessary for retrospective research on patient records, where there is little or no risk of harm to the people whose data is being used? Um. Yes, there are several issues here in terms of um, uh, selection bias. Um, well, one aspect, for example, is that some of these databases, for example, uh, 23andMe, are you aware, have you ever heard of, the, of this? It's, a, it's basically a, a, a company that uh, sells genetic tests. And it has like the biggest uh, database uh, of, uh, uh, the big, the, the big uh, genomics database uh, available at the moment. And this is an issue in terms of, um, you know, so yeah, I, I was thinking about what you were saying about uh, selection biases and the, the type of biases in, in the research that is done during these this databases. And the issue is that um, participants or like donors uh, in, of, of those databases are specific people who can afford buying their tests who are 
you know, very selected uh, cohort. Um, so is research using, you know, that data going to be, going to be biased and, uh, you know, towards, because of the specific cohort. So this is one aspect. Um, but then you were saying uh, whether, you, you were talking about informed consent, um, Yeah, uh, well, the point is that electronic health records have been, are traditionally used for um, clinical management, right? These are, they haven't been, they, they are not normally used for, or they, have, they haven't been traditionally used for research. Uh, now there is some research, especially like in Scandinavian countries, but as, as well as, as in UK, using electronic health records. Um, but it, it, it is a very identifiable source, and of course, yes, some form of consent. I, I, I don't get it why you think it shouldn't be any consent. Given the problem of selection bias. What? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how consent would, uh, would raise this issue. If you require consent for people to access medical, for researchers to for access researchers, people's medical yeah. records, and only certain kinds of people say yes, and because of selection bias, we're unable to predict right. it, it, what it, these yeah, yeah, okay, I see. Are. But it, it's, um, so if you, if you ask for explicit consent, so in, in a case, not in, a, uh, in an opt-out situation, but in an opt-in situation, that's what you say. Um, yeah, it, it, really, it really depends on how you do it. It really depends on how you do it. If, uh, if, if it's, this is something that you do as soon as you, for example, register in a primary care, I mean, if it's part of the, the regular administration where you register uh, for primary care, um, then I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't see this as, 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 a, you know, as, a, as a problem, as a barrier, um, if, it, if it becomes part of the process. So it really de depends on how you introduce this informed consent procedures. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what I, I, think, I think it's very, well, your question partly is, is pushing us to think a lot about the foundations of why we care about consent in the first place as well. So the obvious place where consent is necessary is in something like a surgical procedure, right? And the reason why consent is necessary there is because if someone sticks a knife into you without your consent, that's assault. And that raises the question, what exactly are we waiving? in some of these data cases. Because it looks as though there are cases where I can collect data about you right now. I can look at you, I can see what color your hair is, I can count the number of eyes you have and the number of ears you have. And I haven't violated any of your rights by doing that. So you don't need to consent to my collecting that data. You don't, you don't get to do that because I haven't violated any rights in the first place. I have violated your rights if I stick a knife into you. But if you consent to it because it's a surgical procedure, then that's fine. Um, so I think it's quite helpful in the context of these questions about use of data to think, well, what's the model that's going on in the background here in the first place? And one model is, well, it can't really be that someone's being literally assaulted if their data are used without consent. It might be something to do with <coughs> use of their property, but do we really think that people own their data? It's actually rather difficult to have a proper data ownership model, precisely in cases where data are reanalyzed, repackaged, new inferences are drawn. To try and say, that's still mine, I somehow control it, becomes, I think, quite implausible in those contexts. So I'm, I, I, think, I think it really pushes us quite hard to think about what the, what the rights are that are being waived through use of consent here, and hence whether consent really is necessary in all of these cases or not. So, yeah, one more question? Then pass with you. Yeah, please go ahead. I don't have a question, but I was just going to comment on... Um, Great. The question in... Um, so I've worked in New Zealand around this area with... Um, around patient consent. And the practicalities, really, that they are concerned around is around just... 
Um, as long as the data is anonymized, as long as the data is aggregated, that's fine to do research um, if they've consented from the initial um, set. But the main concern really is around what happens when you have vulnerable communities like people with mental health who feel like their data would be exploited against them. And that's the real concern around um, consent in that case. And that's the only, yeah, and so that's what I just want to make a comment on. Thank you. One more question, so was in the second row? Yeah. Um, in terms of consenting in, about data, I think most of the problem here that comes from uh, people, individuals, being worried about this negatively impacting them. And what should we do as a society to prevent uh, negative impact from data? Because one thing we know is no one can keep data safe. The <laughs> NSA can't keep its stuff safe. Uh, <laughs> Billionaires can't keep their tax info safe <laughs> over the last few days. Yeah. Um, so how do we, as a society, prevent genomic data or mobile data from being misused in this way? Yeah. Um, as, well, as I, as I was saying, it's, yeah, it is a matter of how you, you, you well, or it is often discussed as a matter of how you, um, include and you embed this uh, safety mechanisms uh, within the system, within the technology, because um, also governance mechanisms are hard. You were talking about anonymization, but um, anonymization is a process and there is always a process back uh, to uh, re-identifying people. Um, and it is clearly an issue also because in some cases you do want to, especially in research context, you do need to have more um, uh, more details about the person identity in order to I in order to draw your analysis, um, and uh, several ex several uh, empirical experiments have shown that sometimes it's enough to have uh, location, age, and gender of a person in order to triangulate and to find their identity back. Um, so this is, uh, I, I, you know, that's that, that, that's a question I I I. I, I I don't have an answer, it's something, um, but it's, it's, it's probably a matter of, again, what type of risks uh, we, want to, we, want to pre we want to prevent um, in terms of uh, um, what type of, uh, well, when we talk about, sorry, if we talk about safety uh, or if we talk about security, uh, which are, again, two different things. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know it's also a matter of, of context, which you mentioned earlier on about, you know, if, in which context the data can be used. And uh, I know that uh, um, I mean, the NAFI Council of Bioethics, which you have mentioned before, um, one of the reports that has recently published was on biodata and use of biodata, mm -hmm. how to balance the uh, public good versus the individual good, and looking at question of use of data in which context. And I know that you have uh, worked on, um, and in reply also to to that report, so it's, um, it's not an easy question. Some call for a regulation of the scientific community, so kind of self-governance of uh, scientific community, also in the case of genome editing, that has also been uh, possibly problematic, uh, uh, but it has the strong historical parallels, going back to Asilomar, a regulation of uh, recombinant technology by scientists. Uh, Others have called for a more inclusion, inclusive um, practice, so including the participants, including uh, the voices of the patients from the very first uh, step, so citizen participation in biomedicine, you may have heard uh, uh, this kind of term, and this would be a way to prevent that. But it's a very, very complex issue, so um, thank you for all your questions, also the, uh, the question before, and thank you, Federica, I think, uh, and um, we'll now move to Linus, the last uh, uh, speaker of the panel, and uh, so I'm delighted also to introduce uh, Dr. Linus Wenda. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name. Lenius. Kind of? Lenius. Lenius right. Wenda. Uh, um, founder of Medicines for Africa. Lenius is a global health uh, policy expert uh, who has worked extensively on the impact on global trade rules on patient access to treatment in the context of uh, um, um, in Africa nego negotiation teams in the context of shaping the global response to pandemics, uh, which is another very 
uh, timely topic, uh, also originally trained uh, as an immunologist. So we're delighted to hear from you how we can prepare and respond, if we can prepare at all, to pandemics in a, an ethical way. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. It's very interesting listening to, to all the other speakers that, that came before. Um, because when I was asked to speak about this topic, I wasn't quite sure how you know, it relates to the work that I have done apart from the, you know, besides the, my work as an immunologist when I was doing vaccine development in, in my early career at the Jenner Institute in, in Oxford. But actually listening to, to, to some of the issues that you're facing is very clear that actually even in global policy making, so after leaving uh, my scientific work, I went to work in international affairs in, in, in the United Nations where people are, so, so the, the global community of nations are coming together and discussing issues that impact health worldwide, things like antibiotic resistance, the fact that we are running out of antibiotics in the world and how we deal with that. How do we structure global trade rules and intellectual property rules so that they can better serve the global public good? So, so it's actually interesting, um, and in particular on the issue of pandem pandemic influenza, we have had to deal with issues of concern. So the way the global system is set up to ensure that you know, countries can be prepared when a pandemic occurs is such that every country around the world across the region, so the world is divided into six regions, uh, Africa, the Americas, Europe, uh, um, the Pacific, Southeast, uh, uh, Southeast Asia region. So, so um, you're, the, the global surveillance, there's a global surveillance network that is set up such that you're actually sampling the virus that are circulating in all the countries across the region. So it's, it, it's set up to try to predict when a pandemic might occur and also to help countries, the global community, to prepare. Uh, what should we be doing in between pandemics to be prepared for that? And if a, a pandemic should occur, how do we respond in a way that is ethical, I guess? I mean, we, when we're talking about these issues, we're talking about how to make sure that the response is done in a way that is balanced, scientific, fair, bearing in mind that in the global community, you have countries that are very wealthy and countries that are not so wealthy in terms of the production of vaccines that you would need in the event of a pandemic to be able to prevent the spread of that pandemic, global production tends to be concentrated in a very particular part of the world. It's in Europe, in, 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 in the US, in North America. And so, so how do you make sure that if a pandemic starts in China or Mexico, ideally to protect public health what you want to do what would be ethical at least what 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 the experts consider would be ethical would be to make sure that you deploy the resources the antivirals the vaccines that are required to control the spread of the infection and to limit the damage it might have on global economics and you know, all those other issues that countries very much care about. How do you make sure that you do that in a way that is fair? Because what usually happens, you have a pandemic and everybody panics. Each country wants to protect their own people. But I mean, to, to, to get the resources to where they are needed, it's actually quite challenging because the people who perhaps have ownership of the production, who have the industry that is producing the, the material that you need to be able to respond to the pandemic, they, they want to keep those resources for their own people because what if it comes here? We want to have those, those um, we want to be able to protect the national population. But so, so there is this dilemma in, in the global community that in order to protect, I mean, okay, so the first duty of a statesman is to protect the security of your people before you start thinking about people elsewhere. But with globalization, actually protecting your own people sometimes requires that you protect people over there 
because if you cannot control the spread from there, it's going to come here eventually. So how do you balance, how do you react, respond in a way that is, you know, sort of balanced that you can, you know, protect the people who are actually in the most need because the epidemic is starting in that particular country in Mexico and vaccines have to come from Europe to go there. European countries want to make sure they have enough vaccine in case it comes here, but actually the focus should be there because this is where we can have the most, the greatest impact. And how do you make sure that in between periods when we are anticipating that there might be a pandemic, you know, countries that are not very well resourced have adequate capacity to be able to respond because ultimately it boils down to the to the to the uh, health system, the you know the, the the primary healthcare, as you have seen in the in the um, sort of uh, case with, with with Ebola, when when health systems are weak, it's very difficult to control this you know, the, 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 the epidemic, the pandemic, whatever, whether it's Ebola or, or influenza at, at source so that it doesn't spread and close greater damage globally. So, 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 the, so those are some of the, the issues, how, how countries do that. And, and so countries try to do that by uh, negotiating uh, common standards of what they need to do, the decision-making processes, how it should be done, and, and you know, how do you deploy, what is the criteria for deciding, you know, firstly that it's a pandemic and then how to get resources to country A versus country B in order to, to, to prevent sort of global spread. So, so those are some of the issues I think, at least in, 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 um, in, in pandemic, um, in controlling pandemic influenza, the ethical issues that countries have to sort of discuss and agree. What, what is the sensible way of doing this in order to, to protect global commerce? And because ultimately, I mean, okay, you want to control health, you want to prevent damage to health, but they are also interest, you know, potential damage to the, to the, to the broader um, interests of countries. So, so basically, yes, it's done using these legal frameworks, international legal instruments. There is a, a particular one called international health regula regulations that gives countries sort of criteria of what needs to be done, how you report, you know, those things. The ethics, so when countries share viruses and contribute to the global surveillance system, how should you govern that? Who owns, so, you know, you, every country is contributing to this. Research is done. Let's say there is a pandemic. We get a vaccine out. Who owns the intellectual property that comes out of uh, research that has been done using viral resources, genetic material that has been gathered from a communal effort, you know, across the globe, all countries contributing. Who owns that? So the the private sector company that might come and exploit that and develop that vaccine. Do they, should they sell that vaccine to the country that might have provided the viral isolate that led to the production of that vaccine? You know, how do you balance that? Because they have invested money, they, they have a you know, claim to that, IP rules apply and, and so forth. So it's those kinds of issues. How you think about that? How you make that fair so that it serves the wealthy and the poor equally? Because when you're talking of, you know, sort of, I guess, global cooperation to protect, you know, your citizens as well as their citizens, somehow you have to strike that balance, that ethical balance. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Lenia. So, you know, more and more complex issues in a, in a global way. I'm also, uh, so there is time for questions. I'm interested to know if you can tell us a little bit more about something that you have worked on and you raised uh, lots of, uh, no, great uh, question on how we're going to prepare in a fair and ethical way for pandemics and how is intellectual property going to be regulated in a global context. There is also a question of freedom of, um, of research when you're working on a sensitive topic such as uh, viruses and dual use of research, so how it can be used in, for good or bad use if possible. But if uh, I can just you the advantage of being a chair. Uh, you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more of something about your own work so that you can share with the new generation if they're interested in 
move into policy because you yes. were an immunologist and yes. you moved to policy. Yes, so, so I started my early career working as a scientist, as an immunologist, uh, developing vaccines. So actually I have encountered you know, issues of informed consent and so forth, doing phase one, phase two clinical trials and, and then moved away from that because my interest was in sort of the, you know, the delivery of technology. Once you have uh, technology, how do, you know, the, the politics of getting that to the people that need it because sometimes the challenge is not always the lack of innovation. It's actually getting the innovations to the people who need it. That's a big challenge that is contributing to poor access. So this is an area that has always been very interesting and that is why I sort of less interesting for me. That's why I left science to go into sort of international politics. And there, you know, a lot of the discussion revolved quite a lot around access to, 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 to technology, to medicines, to devices, equipment and so forth that you need to diagnose and treat Ill illness. And so, and so from there, but it, it's very complex, it, it, you know, getting 194 countries to, ha to agree that, you know, on a common standard that this is what we are going to do and we're going to go into our countries and make this international law and so forth. It's very complex and messy process. So, so that quickly got very frustrating and I was actually interested in working in an area where I could actually have more impact, more direct impact on the issues of access to treatments and, and, and so forth. And so I left, um, that I, I, I had my, my daughter, and after that I decided perhaps this wasn't really the setting that I, I, I didn't enjoy the, the, the global policy making, some aspects of it. So, so I became an entrepreneur and started Medicines for Africa. So, so basically what we're trying to do is to solve one aspect of you know, one contributing factor to poor access to treatments for people in, in, in African countries. We're focusing on that because that is where the, there, is, there are biggest gaps. And of course, I, I come from there as well. And we are doing this by trying to create market efficiencies. So there are a lot of inefficiencies in the way that countries procure medicines, for national needs within countries in the, in the region. So each country goes and buys individually. When you look at you know, the population of an individual country, it's very small. And so when you have small volumes, you're buying small volume for a country of 12 million people, or if you're Botswana, you're buying for 5 million people, you, the, the, the prices that you can negotiate, you, you are very limited in leveraging you know, for better prices. So basically when you do the analysis, you see that African countries tend to pay actually quite a lot more for medicines, even though, you know, in, in uh, pharmaceutical companies, they, there's differential pricing and all sorts of innovative ways that they're trying to think around, trying to, you know, how they can contribute to, to helping improve access by patients. But still, it's, not, it's still not enough. Countries are still paying a lot more compared to the prices that are achievable on the international market. So, so we're trying to solve that problem by creating the scale that is needed so you can leverage scale. So if you get five countries buying together, each one with 12 million people, you've expanded the, the, the scale a lot and you can use that volume to, to, to get better prices. And also manufacturers are more willing to bring the price down. And you know, so, so this is the sort of thing that I am doing now. So I'm now an entrepreneur. I'm no longer uh, working in, in, in global policy even though, I mean, working in this area, we still have to deal with issues of IP and, for instance, if you have a product that is needed by patients in South Africa, for instance, it's not approved in that country or there are some issues why it hasn't received marketing approval, you have to start speaking to the policy makers or the regulators how to, to, to bring the approval or manufacturers trying to... So, you know, just different mechanisms of trying to improve access to medicines and treatments for patients. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. That's very interesting, I think, also for all of you. So we have uh, time for one question, and then you can, one question. Then you can find us during the, the, the break. Please. Hello, my name is Adam Abdurrahman. I'm a master student at the University of Glasgow, although I'm a Nigerian. I spent most of my life time in Nigeria. And in my lifetime alone, we have had a lot of epidemics, SARS, avian influenza, Ebola. I remember when I was in Nigeria, I do 
when we have these epidemics, when I go to the rural areas, we see a lot of people dying, suffering. When we, open, when we go to BBC or Sky News or things like that, we hear about this amazing research that's going on, this wonderful drug that is in Europe and America. On the other hand, we are seeing people dying and they are not getting it. So my, so my question is, how can we improve accessibility of, of these vaccines or drugs to the rural areas in Africa where this is going on? Because if we are, most of these vaccines are produced in Europe and America, and sometimes Ebola or some of these things, we hear one case or two cases or three cases, yet we are seeing a lot of research focusing on those three cases when we have thousands of cases in Africa. So how can we improve, how can we focus the global community to Africa, to Africa and some of these developing countries where these epidemics are actually much more, are causing much more damage than in Europe and America where you see one or two people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. you want to well, that's, it's, a, it's a really complex issue. Um, it's not simply an issue of, you know, the fa of vaccines being produced in, in Europe or in, in a particular part of the world. I think it's a lot more complex than that. It's, you know, it's how, so businesses are in the business of making money. When they make decisions about where to invest they tend to focus on areas that, that is, you know, um, obviously going to bring them more revenue and so forth. And unfortunately, that means for certain kinds of illnesses that, you know, don't have bigger markets or that, that are unlikely to generate a lot of revenue, they may, you know, they, they often make a decision maybe not to invest in that. So, so this is a question of how do you finance you know, global innovation. And it, it's, it's a question that is hotly being debated in, in the global community. How do you finance research and development in a way that it, it can better serve the needs of every patient? Whether, you know, the, the, that particular illness has a large enough demographic in order to, to generate a lot of money, or, you know, whether it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a huge problem that's going to... How do you balance that? How do you make that decision? And it's a really, really complex issue because pharmaceutical companies, I mean, whether you agree with the, the, the way they, they, they structure their pricing and so forth, they, they are doing this to, to make money, but do they also have maybe a social responsibility to contribute in the communities that, you know, that they do business? And, and therefore, do they have a responsibility to invest in areas that may not necessarily bring them a lot of money, you know, to, to, in order to meet their social responsibility to the people that they are serving? So this is, you know, really a question that, I mean, it depends where you stand. It's very political and very difficult to have a single answer. And, you know, whether... Uh, you know, the, the protection of IP should be, I mean, there are global rules about IP that says that, you know, in areas where, you know, I, application of the, or, or strict application of um, IP or enforcement undermines health, countries can actually override those laws in order to protect public health. So there are actually provisions for that to make sure that you know, these things can, can serve people, but whether it, it works or not, it, it, it's not, I mean, it's, it doesn't always work. That's all I can say. Well, thank you. So there seems there is a lot of work for you guys to do if you want to. <laughs> In the future, corporate uh, social ethics responsibility, uh, pandemics, genome editing, um, or genome sequencing projects. So I think our time is up for this panel, but for those of you who still had questions, you can uh, uh, find us during uh, the break. But please join me in thanking again the, the panelists, uh, Tim Child, Tim Lewis, Federico Nuciveral, and Yaswenda, and thank you for your questions. Thank you.